Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another Nacho Tuesday. And today, we're going to be discussing HR trends in 2023 and beyond. Uh, today, I have Malik, who is the CEO of CodeMonk.ai. I have Bryce Froberg, who is the managing member of the Background Check Company. And we have Ty Radigan, who's the global head of partnerships at Deal. Uh, so without further ado, I'd love uh, if you guys can give us a brief elevator pitch for what your company does, uh, starting with Malik. Hey, thank you, Andy, for having us today. And it's great to be on this platform with now with Deal and, uh, you know, the background check company. You know, we seems to be in a similar space here, but complementary service offering. Uh, so CodeMonk is a platform for companies to build on-demand elastic tech teams. Uh, and we have got two components to that. One, and a machine learning algorithm to understand the gap in your existing team and upcoming product roadmap uh, and a talent marketplace from which you can source the talent to fill those gaps. Great. And uh, Ty, would, would you like to give us an introduction to Deal? Sure, yeah. So uh, Deal is a global HR company uh, and we believe that talent is distributed around the world and we enable companies to be able to hire anyone anywhere. So whether that's uh, as contractors or under an employee of record model or running global payroll under with employees on your own entities, Deal just makes it really, really easy to operate a global business. Great. And uh, Bryce, go ahead. Yeah, I'm with the Background Check Company. It's what TBCC stands for. It's just a little bit of a long name. We do pre-employment screening and background checks for companies. So we integrate with larger ATSs and HRIS softwares, as well as just a standalone software offering uh, to clients. So we are looking to provide any feedback on criminal history for any employees that you might be trying to hire. It's great to hear. Yeah, and I'd love if you guys could maybe give us uh, maybe a background on how you got to where you're at today. Um, you know, starting with Ty, I guess, uh, what got you into the HR software field? Yeah, yeah. So I, uh, I started my career at American Express uh, and spent five years doing various uh, kind of business development, marketing, uh, account management roles. Uh, I was always really excited to get into tech. Uh, and so I was fortunate to do that at a company called Optimizely and ended up building out our partner business, uh, especially in EMEA. Uh, and then I worked at a company called Amplitude and built out the partner business there as well. And uh, afterwards, spent a little bit of time working in venture capital. Uh, and, th th and then I later got introduced to the team at Deal. Uh, and what really got me excited about joining Deal originally was the um, like the, just the opportunity that we have here from a partner ecosystem perspective. Uh, so whether, um, you know, someone's uh, running a recruiting company, HR advisory, accounting business, like all the way through to VCs and tech companies around the world, Deal really sits in the middle of that uh, ecosystem. And we're really invested in helping companies be successful in global HR, like uh, and working with our large uh, base of customers. So that's what got me really excited was the opportunity. I'll say I've spent the last year doing a real deep dive on HR and like getting up to speed on things. But I've personally set up uh, entities in the UK, uh, like helped open offices in Singapore and Japan, uh, like uh, as a revenue leader myself. And so experience firsthand how difficult it is to operate a global business and so uh, when i got to know deal uh, i really got the value proposition straight away because it is such a challenge but also like uh, a massive opportunity for businesses when done well it's great yeah both uh, great companies that you worked with before i've heard of both of them so um so you're the guy behind the behind the the wizard behind the scenes <laughs> <laughs> um so bryce uh, we'd love to hear your background as well too how how'd you get into uh background checks and uh, I know we grew up together and all that as well but uh, the audience yeah. would like to you know learn from you as well <laughs> yeah no certainly and it's great to reconnect Andy um, I was fortunate uh, I kind of had this goal of owning businesses and when I finished school I got into trying to do that and have met some really good entrepreneurs that have kind of brought me under and their wing from a mentorship standpoint and as I was running my businesses I just realized how frustrating background checks are at times and so that was one of many pain points that business owners come across. There's, you know, a myriad of, of things to solve for at any given time. And in talking with just people in the HR space and just trying to understand better, you know, we were a small business. There are different challenges at that size than there are when you're in that mid market to large. Um, and so just trying to understand what the issues were, why it was so frustrating conducting background checks. And then met a gentleman that had a business um, in this space. And I thought he did a lot of things really, really well. 
and he was looking to exit and I was looking to get into something that was kind of more in that um, SaaS space as well. But also just from a service standpoint, we're really focused on small to mid-sized companies and trying to bring additional value that they may not get in this space. And so that's what kind of got me in. And then the staying power has been, if we can provide enough value to our clients, they won't look anywhere else. And that's what we've been focused on. That's great. Malik, uh, how'd you get into uh, HR yourself? I uh, your background as well. <laughs> yeah. So um, I would say I'm, I'm not really into an HR space, you know, but it's a part of uh, what I have been doing. Um, so my background has always been into product management. I've been a product manager for many companies like big multinationals like uh, Wall Street Journal, Visa, Microsoft and all. Uh, but I've been also involved in a lot of startups, you know, first person on the ground and building the whole product and product teams uh, to deliver the, the product strategy. And the big frustration I always had was your product roadmap keeps on changing pretty much every other day, but you're stuck with the team that you that you recruited for and you may build the best team for your roadmap or your current product or product or business requirements but within few weeks that requirements change and your team may not be able to uh, you know evolve as quickly as you want them to uh, so you always have this lag uh, between when you need the skills and when you have the skills uh, because recruitment is very reactive uh, so that's where the idea came in that hey you know what we want to build something where you can just tap into the skills as and when you want to. And as we started researching more, we discovered a lot of problems like, you know, contracts, like, you know, freelance versus permanent, you know, the worker classifications, uh, you know, on-demand hiring, uh, you always have come with a budget. Um, so, you know, where do, you, where do you go for skills when you're not able to find skills in your local market? So you go for the remote work and so on. So that's all uh, what we were trying to solve for. Um, so we ended up building this talent marketplace uh, which I, I believe there are plenty of other marketplace out there as well. Uh, but our difference is and was this whole finding the gap in your existing team. Uh, and we are trying to solve for upcoming product roadmap. So we are trying to be predictive uh, of what's coming next uh, for you to deliver your roadmap. Where is your gap in your existing team? And how do you fill that gap quickly? Um, and that's what we want to focus on now. Uh, the employer of record, freelance hiring and all that, uh, you know, I'm proud to say we are one of the partner of deal. Uh, so we just leave that uh, for our clients to work directly uh, with partner like that. Also background checks uh, with other partners uh, is what we do, but we want to focus purely on, uh, on on matching your product, the gap in your product roadmap and the skills uh, in your team and try to fill that. Great. So uh, AI has been a hot topic lately, of course. I mean, I'm sure you guys heard the buzzword, right? <laughs> uh, how do you see AI affecting the job market, um, you know, today and in the future, as well as the hiring process itself? Um, I, I can take the lead here because we are already working on it. Um, see, AI has been out there for a long period of time. I would say 50, 60 years, maybe longer. Uh, what's happening now is that it's becoming pretty much mainstream. You know, the processing power has increased, the data models are there. So it's really getting smarter and smarter. Uh, and that's impacting how every single thing is done. Um, and it's surprising to see that a lot of AI actually works in the background without, without a lot of people understanding or realizing that. Probably this call, you know, there is some background AI processing going on uh, in this video stream and all, which we don't probably know. Uh, and that's what has been happening for a long period of time. And as with this whole chat GPT and the other models are coming out, uh, there's suddenly an explosion mm -hmm. of this AI startup and, you know, huge investment going in, in, in that space. I don't think it's going to displace a lot of jobs. Uh, sorry, it is going to remove a lot of jobs, but it probably will displace a lot of jobs uh, mm -hmm. from one specialism to another specialism. Yeah. Uh, and talking specifically within the HR or recruitment space. Um, I think uh, from my point of view, uh, you know, we, when you're trying to recruit, you know, you're trying to create the JD, you're trying to match the candidate manually, you know, you are trying to do keyword search and so on. I think all those mundane tasks can be easily automated uh, mm -hmm. using AI. Uh, so, you know, hopefully, hopefully you identify it, you press a button and you have the best candidate available to you anywhere in the world. Yep. Right. You don't have to worry that, hey, can I get this person uh, tomorrow or not? You know, currently you wait like what, 30 days, 60 days to get that person on board it. And probably those those uh, those waiting periods, those, that period will go away. 
That's great to hear. What, what do you think about that, Ty or Bryce? Yeah, we're, we're also working a ton on AI uh, internally. We have an amazing team spun up of engineers and writers uh, who are, uh, you know, starting with enabling our internal team to uh, be able to operate more efficiently. You know, like Deal has a, across the hundred plus countries that we operate in, just a extremely broad wealth of knowledge. And so making that really easy for people to access, you know, previously someone would use Notion or like a, a wiki or something like that, being able to uh, use AI to be able to like conversationally make that those types of things available is, is really helpful. And so I think like a lot of companies are going to, maybe people are seeing this as an opportunity for efficiency, but like in actuality, we'll see this as a way to uh, enable people to be more successful in their current roles. And so I do think that from an employee engagement and from uh, an employee uh, employee happiness perspective, we're going to see amazing improvements through AI tools. I do also think that there is opportunities for uh, people to like improve the candidate process, like interviewing, uh, providing people information throughout the process, like keeping everyone up to date. Like that, that's going to be able to get a lot more tight with the tools that people are developing. And I'm really excited to see that as well. Um, you know, the, the, I think the fear of uh, there being a big negative um, impact from AI, at least in the near term, are probably um, overblown. That's great to hear. Uh, yeah, you... I, 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 okay. I, really, I really hope it's, it is going to be overblown. Um, but I, I do think there are areas where it can help out tremendously. You know, you think about the diamond in the rough or kind of product market fit, if we can use a different terminology, when you're looking at talent that you're bringing in, do they fit with your culture, your company? We have a partner company that utilizes AI to do a disk assessment on applicants. They can see, do they fit their persona that they're looking to hire for in that position? So when you look at like larger retailers with a lot of locations, they know what a successful manager looks like from a persona standpoint. And so they're utilizing a disk assessment to see, are these applicants a fit for us from a persona standpoint? And then we can train them and onboard them, but you know, do they come with the right mentality, the right attitude? And so, I hope it is used consistently as a way to complement the hiring process and um, doesn't become kind of that replacement factor, but a lot of really cool things going on. It just depends on what's going to stick and what's going to add the most value. Yep. Certainly. We're still very much in the early days and I definitely agree with all of you guys. I think it's a, an exciting time uh, with the way that technology is moving. So we'll, we'll see what the next few, few years look like, but yeah, hopefully it doesn't displace too many jobs. I feel like there's going to be a lot of jobs that maybe change a little bit. And, you know, to your guys's point, uh, a lot of people are going to be able to focus on the work that really matters to them and for the organization and maybe let AI do some of the, uh, you know, some of the repetitive uh, work that nobody wants to do anyway. <laughs> um, moving on from AI, there's many HR tools out there. Uh, so what are some simple tricks, I guess, uh, Ty, that you would recommend for HR managers and business owners to use to find and attract the best talent? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, you know, I think, uh, there's a, there's a great selection of tools for sure. Uh, deal partners with all of them. So, uh, you know, I, I, uh, we, we don't pick favorites. Um, I do think like the, the thing that's really important, especially in this environment is running like a really smooth tight process uh, on, on hiring new, uh, bringing in new candidates, making sure that your job description's really uh, accurate and also like kind of friendly and accessible so that you're getting the right candidates in the pipeline and just making it really simple to qualify people in and out. You know, the reality is that there have been a ton of uh, layoffs. Uh, and so there are some amazing candidates out in the market that weren't available a year or two years ago. Uh, and so like there's, there's a great talent pool to go out and access. And at the same time, you, it's still competitive and you have to run a really, really tight process. So getting a good ATS in place, getting great uh, job descriptions in place, like it, being really clear about your uh, your benefits, like getting a good scheduling tool, like all of those things that you can implement to like run a really tight process is awesome. The thing that we see a lot working at Deal is like people still want the flexibility to be able to uh, either work from home or also work from other places. 
Uh, and so, uh, you know, where someone wants to be able to work uh, in a distributed way or be able to work in other countries uh, or have that flexibility, having the option to for someone to be employed as a contractor or also quickly in another location is a real benefit as well, especially for like hard to get hires. And so uh, we've seen deal be like a real benefit as part of that stack also. That's a great point. Yeah, and a lot of a lot of companies, especially startups, you know, in a competitive job market, as even even if there is talent out there, there's always you know everybody's competing for the best of the best, right? And they get snatched up quickly. Um, but uh, you know, using perks like remote work, like you mentioned, there's a lot of little perks that a lot of startups can offer these days that can attract some of the top talent, uh, even if they're underpaid compared to like what they can go get working at a Fortune 500. Um, you know, selling that that vision for the product that you're working on and. Uh, you know, what your startup's going to accomplish. Some people really value equity. And so, you know, think in terms of like what kind of a package you can put together to offer this talent to attract them over to your startup, even if, you know, you might not be able to compete um, dollar-wise with some of the bigger companies out there. Um, Bryce, where do you see uh, some uh, new opportunities in the technology space as far as jobs are concerned? Obviously, you now we mentioned AI. Do you see any other areas, uh, you know, uh, areas of opportunity for people to get into the technology space given recent trends. Yeah, I think Ty actually hit uh, the nail on the head with something that I, I'm finding to be more and more interesting. You know, you look at some of these larger tech companies, very sophisticated, uh, talented employment pools that have been laid off, right? And so now you're, those people need to go somewhere. Um, they need to be able to provide for themselves. And we're seeing that start to kind of leach into maybe some of those smaller companies or industries that maybe weren't their first choice out the gate. And I think what we're going to see there, you know, you look at leisure and hospitality, that's one sector that's growing quite quickly right now, as far as employment goes, that took a pretty big dive during the pandemic, that's coming back. They may now have access to a slightly different talent pool than they did before. Um, you know, Alaska Airlines came out with a, a really nice article recently as well, just talking about how they've had success hiring tech talent that are going to help support their goals down the road where they may not have had that chance when Facebook, Twitter, um, Microsoft were hiring a little more aggressively. So where it's going to go, um, I'm not 100% sure, but I think that we're going to see industries take on a technology adoption in maybe a different way with access to a little more um, talent that's in that software engineering, software development space might allow them to execute on their goals a bit quicker, which will be exciting to see. And then those employees that are there, again, will, will adapt and either be displaced into other roles or take on um, a job somewhere else. But I think we're going to see a really nice influence in the retail hospitality space from technology. It's great to hear. Um, Malik, uh, moving up a question for you. Uh, uh, what are, what do you think are the biggest bottlenecks in scaling a team effectively? Um, you run a relatively large organization over there. Uh, what kind of tips would you have for, you know, helping teams scale and companies get past that, that seed to a high growth stage? Um, to be honest, in my experience, I think, uh, of course, there can be a number of reasons, but the two uh, that I found uh, quite impactful uh, when it comes to being the bottleneck uh, and something that I myself uh, uh, is guilty of uh, is number one, uh, having unrealistic expectation of what you're looking to hire. And number two, the process you design to basically get that person, you know, which uh, you set the bar so high and then you're just waiting and going through the process over and over, filtering a lot of candidates and you never find it. Uh, and by the time you find someone at the end, the opportunity is already gone, uh, you know, and that has happened to me a number of times. Um, so I think that those two would be the biggest one for me. Um, and just building on that, I think the solution, uh, which I would suggest is number one, uh, be more realistic on what you're expecting from the candidates. You know, there is, there is never a perfect match, you know, uh, even in, in dating or, or marriage, you know, there is never a perfect partner. You have to make it perfect. Uh, and similarly, I think it goes in, in tech or when you're hiring for people, you're never going to find the perfect ideal candidate. You, If you get one, you're incredibly lucky, uh, but 99% of the time you're not going to. Uh, so find the most optimal or most suitable candidate for the task to be done. Uh, and just make it work between between your existing team uh, and, and that person, you know, and be very real about the expectation that, hey, if it's a short term engagement, uh, then just focus on getting your immediate priorities completed uh, versus, you know, hiring someone for a long period of time. And so then you really want to hire for the for the long term vision, not for your immediate uh, needs and priorities. Right. Uh, so just work on that. 
Yeah, the grass is green where you water it, right? <laughs> yes. Uh, Ty, so what? Uh, kind of rolling off his point there, bringing on a new team member, it's very important that you onboard him correctly. Uh, what would you say are some of the most critical things that a hiring manager should do in the first couple of weeks to make sure that a team member is onboarded properly and they feel comfortable in their new role? Yeah, it's 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 so critical uh, having a great onboarding plan for new hires. You know, you spend so much time try, searching for the right candidate. You know, like going through that whole process, and then if you don't onboard them and ramp them success, successfully, it's such a massive waste of time. Uh, so, you know, I mean, having again clear, really clear documentation on the expectations of the role, like how success is measured, like what success would look like in the first week first 30 days like having a really simple checklist for them to do ideally having like a training program already established enablement set up uh, setting them up with a buddy that they can work really closely with through that time someone that's going to meet with them every day and just kind of check in on how everything's going like do they have questions uh, and then like just like providing connections and support into other departments in the business as well Deals a completely remote company, uh, and so you know even more so. This is important where you're uh, remote and you don't you overhear conversations in the office or go and do uh, coffee breaks with or lunches with people. You know you, you have to have all of this stuff uh, be very considered and uh, well documented and proactive. Uh, and so yeah, like really thinking about that in advance. We we have a template for every role. Uh, but we really customize it for every new person based on like their existing experience in our industry and their background. Great. Uh, do you, any of you guys have any funny stories or experiences uh, uh, being a hiring manager without naming names, of course, um, that you might want to share with the audience? I, I have one. Uh, so we were hiring for, for this role. I can't remember what role it was, but this candidate comes up and uh, uh, you know, I always start with a very basic questions like, uh, hey, tell me what is two plus two is equal to, right? And answer is four. And uh, so I ask some very simple questions like, you know, primary school mathematics and all. Um, and and the one of the simple questions he could not answer. Uh, and I said, like, hey, this is like, you know, primary school stuff. And, you know, you should know. Uh, even my receptionist would know. Uh, and he got so offended about that. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then he ended up, uh, you know, walking away from the interview. And then uh, he called up the the, the HR manager complaining about me for asking that question. Yeah, that's an important thing about <laughs> HR. <laughs> it's always yeah. walking my mind. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, and the thing is, this happened within the first, like, couple of minutes. You know, I, I did not even get to the point where I would actually ask relevant question to the project. It was just getting him warmed up to, to the whole process, interview process. Uh, just to break the ice and, you know, getting started on, hey, you know what, let's start something easy. Uh, but he felt offended about that. I've had people before ask, uh, how much are you going to pay me? And like the whole conversation was around, so what do I get? You know, and you're like, well, uh, can we talk about your skills first? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Some yeah we, we've had a little bit of fun with that as well, Andy. Um, and one of the things that kind of hits me is we ask some questions that are maybe less formal. You know, hey, what's something about you that we wouldn't learn just through a normal um, Great traditional interview process? Or what's a skill set maybe that you have that won't show up at work? And the stuff that we've had now employees or former employees or people that we missed out on, you know, the talent that people have is, is so robust and it's so much more than just the job description they're applying for, right? They're obviously trying to put their best foot forward. But one of the things that not necessarily, I mean, it was, it was suggested to me, it's not my idea, but we really try to humanize the interview process. That can be a pretty stressful time for people. Um, some people just from an anxiety standpoint, just aren't, aren't great during the interview process. And so we try to hum humanize that process because to Ty's point, during that onboarding process, you know, we'll assign either a mentor from a different division. So there's not this conflict of interest potentially. And, but we want to have a basis for a relationship maybe that, um, isn't just I'm great with Excel or I'm, you know, I'm great at onboarding new clients or whatever it may be. Right. That's a little more transactional. And I'll tell you what, we have some very talented people in some very weird ways um, at the company, just hobbies that they do outside of work that we never would have thought of. So kind of a cool way to get to know your, your coworkers that way, if you can get outside of the scripted questions. 
Yeah, there's a lot more than shows up on resumes, right? And, uh, you know, yeah. I think a lot of those soft skills and the personalities of people really, you know, comes through. And, you know, if you interview for that, you know, a good, you know, strong character can, uh, you know, overcome pretty much any challenge that you throw at them, even if they might not, you know, look the part on, on, their, on their resume initially uh, that some of, somebody else might. Uh, so those are always great questions to ask. Good point. Uh, how about you, Ty? Yeah, uh, g g great questions. I, well, I have had like working in a remote environment situations where people haven't received their laptops and like going back to the funny story situation, you know, like people will be a week in and still don't have a laptop and like uh, they're working off of their phone or whatever. <laughs> yeah, like we have a great partnership with a company called Hoffy at Deal where like um, we do like equipment delivery. And so like we don't run into that problem as much internally, uh, but definitely the last like, three, four years. I'm embarrassed to say how many times people haven't received their laptop on time or like, you know, haven't been provisioned uh, access to their emails on their first day. You know, uh, there's definitely some of that stuff where it's like, uh, you know, you're trying to chase someone down because you haven't, you think they haven't shown up for work and actually like they didn't get their Slack or email access and, you know, you can't, and you don't have the cell phone number, for instance, you know. Uh, so there's definitely some like hiccups and headaches that we had to overcome with that. Yeah, like, I can't get to the checklist yet. I can't do all this stuff on my phone. Yeah, well, like, I didn't know I had a checklist. You know, I don't have access yeah. to Google Drive yet. You know, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, security protocols. I, I'll tell a funny story on that one. So one telco, one big global multinational telco I work for, uh, they couldn't get the laptops ready for their in-office teams, you know, like 30 days after they have joined. So they're coming, like, every single day and just don't do any, can't do any work. Then they started like, talking to all the employees and <laughs> distracting yeah. them. <laughs> yeah, and that wasn't even remote. That was like in-office working. And their IT team was in the office and still they took like a month to, to get the laptops uh, issued. Oh, that'd be an awkward situation. <laughs> <laughs> so there are many uh, HR tools out there and you know, feel free to plug your own, of course. Um, you know, what are some tips, I guess, for, uh, for you know, hiring managers or business owners to look for when they're trying to pick the right HR tool for them? You know, and feel free to plug your products as well. Uh, go ahead, uh, Malik. Um, I think there are plenty of tools out there, and um, uh, most of the tools have, like you know, a lot of overlap from one tool to another. And uh, uh, I would say, now of course, use CodeMonk for your sourcing of the talent, global talent. We're trying to be alternative to LinkedIn, uh, so I would definitely watch for it. Uh, but apart from that, I think. Uh, um, you have like Deal is an amazing tool uh, for your remote uh, remote teams. Uh, there's Oyster HR, which is a, a remote uh, HR platform as well. Uh, but they offer a lot more features uh, on top of uh, the employer record provider. That's an amazing uh, platform as well. Um, uh, Workday is good, but Workday I think it works mainly for uh, uh, SMBs and LEs. You know, it does not really work well for startup. It's probably too expensive and prohibitive for for, for startup. Um, for Sony recently has been doing very well. Uh, so I think these are some of the tools that I can I can think of are, are really well designed in this space. Great point. How about you, uh, Bryce? Yeah, I think my suggestion is more high level. I would say, you know, to Malik's point, there are different tools based on your size. And there's also different tools that I think are maybe more compatible based on industry. Now, I believe HR, people in HR um, have a lot on their plate. There are tremendous amount of challenges to try to not only evaluate what to be utilizing, but also during that hiring process, there are challenges. And so it's really, uh, for lack of a better analogy, you know, you go out, if you, if you go out and buy a kid's shoes, you usually get them a half size or a size bigger than they are just because yeah. they're growing so fast. Right. Um, you kind of want to look at your HR software that way as well is, okay, well, where are we realistically going in the next 12, 24, 36 months? is this software too robust or is this going to help us get there? And I think you want to view it from that perspective because there are some very, very robust, but also expensive tools out there that would potentially be a phenomenal benefit if you scale to where you think you're going to be, but don't get too far ahead of yourself. Use the right tool for where you're at as a company. Um, again, that's high level, but that's really what I would say. There are a lot of really, really strong HR tools out there, but it depends on what you're looking to accomplish and then also what industry you're in at times as well. That's a great point. Yeah, I like the uh, the analogy of uh, you know kids growing into growing into uh, growing into their shoes because you know obviously as a company you want to be growing, so 
you know, you should be looking at, you should be looking ahead and in terms of where you might be six to six months to a year. And if that software is actually still going to serve your needs based on your projected growth. Um, Malik, a, a lot of startup founders are always looking for a technical founder, co-founder, um, and they might be non-technical. Uh, what would you recommend for non-technical founders to attract a technical founder to be a part of their team or maybe their first engineer on their team? Uh, oh, okay. Interesting question. You know, I work for a lot of startups and often I, I have been the first person on the ground. Uh, so I can talk from my own personal experience. Uh, I think a lot of founders, the mistake they make is that they're just not starting their idea properly or not in the full effect. Uh, they're trying to be too protective about it. They think that, uh, hey, if I talk about my idea, someone is going to steal that, right? Yep. In my opinion, ideas are useless. You know, it doesn't matter. You yep. know, you tell your ideas to 100 people, you know, if someone can execute better than you, that it be. Um, so never be afraid of really selling your idea uh, to everyone you meet. You not only the tech talent, but, you know, anyone you meet and get feedback and really trade on it. Um, and once you get the buy-in in the idea from, let's say, one of the potential tech person uh, that, that you, you're uh, looking to bring on board, uh, you'd really want that person to commit to that reason and that idea for a long period of time. You know, you're not looking for a developer who can just come in and, and develop your MVP or, you know, write some lines of code to, you know, get some uh, the landing page out. That's not your CTO or the first hire. Uh, so, you know, now avoid that. Um, and, and second, there are plenty of uh, platforms out there where you can get, uh, like, you know, tech talent comment on your idea, give feedback to you, and also, you know, uh, team up with you to, to make that uh, a, a reality. It could be, uh, you know, that person may want to come as a co-founder or not, but at least it will help you, you know, get the initial, you know, hacky, you know, beta prototype out. Uh, so Reddit, I think they have a, a public forum where you can post your idea and people can respond to it. Uh, there's Indie Hacker, where again, there is a, there's a full uh, thread of co-founders. So you put your idea, people will comment on it and will give you feedback and, and work with you to develop that. So I think there are quite a few platforms out there uh, where, where you can do that. That's a great point. Thanks for the recommendation. We have a lot of startups and uh, you know younger companies as well as SMBs and whatnot that uh, follow our platform. So... Now that those type of tips are very helpful for them. Uh, so now that we're in a global business environment, um, Ty, could you elaborate on the opportunity available for companies now to expand globally? And what are the pitfalls of that? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I think um, you're, you're right. There's a, there's a ton of reasons why like we're entering into like a truly global business environment. You know, one is like, uh, like the expanded access of internet around the world and like they're really becoming like a global culture of business rather than like nuanced local business cultures uh, like it has been historically uh, you know and and that has opened uh, like a huge huge uh, opportunity for businesses to be able to ex expand globally also the reality is that you know we're operating in an environment of the lowest uh, unemployment rate in the US and many other uh, like tier one markets around the world. And so it's incredibly difficult to hire top talent, even with like more availability happening at the moment. The, the, between those two things and a bunch of other factors, uh, it's never been more important for companies to be able to look abroad, to be able to grow scalably, expand revenue, access new customers. Um, you know, the, the pitfalls that, uh, so there, there, there's a bunch of opportunities there, right? Like the, the pitfalls that we often see are like, people will get slowed down in the administrative burden of doing, you know, like I've set up a, a, a an office in Japan uh, and it took us 18 months to get the entity established before we could even start hiring someone, you know, or uh, like, and even then we, we set up an office and we, it took us another 24 months to realize we shouldn't have an office in Japan and like it wasn't a good market for us. And so that whole like, MVP fail fast type thing doesn't work, uh, uh, you know, like when you're having to go through these like really bureaucratic governmental processes. And so like figuring out how to test markets quickly and easily and be data driven and if you can like set up contractors or people that are willing to like be more flexible about uh, working in those markets, then it's a really smart approach because you can kind of figure out where your highest opportunity markets are 
uh, like where you're going to be able to have the highest impact and like deploy resources there. Uh, because the reality is that like some markets are going to be great for some companies and others aren't. And and, and it's really important to get that right uh, before you burn a ton, a, ton, a ton of resources and uh, revenue. Great points. Well, I really appreciate all of you guys coming on today, uh, talking about HR trends in 2023 and beyond. I think uh, your audience is able to walk away from this learning a lot. Um, obviously, you guys have a lot of experience in this space. So I really appreciate your time coming on today and uh, tie with deal. Uh, Malik with CodeMonk and Bryce Froberg with the Background Check Company. Uh, I definitely recommend everybody that's uh, following Nacho Nacho to go check out these great, amazing HR tools. Uh, you can find them today in the Nacho Nacho B2B SaaS marketplace, uh, the best place to manage, to cover, and save on sales. Uh, once again, these are great tools from uh, some great entrepreneurs and business leaders, and I highly recommend you checking them out today. Thanks again, guys. Appreciate you coming Thank on. You. Thanks, Thanks, everyone. everyone.